Would you like to not only thrive, but thrive on purpose? Then this podcast is for you, inspiring you to embark on a transformational journey. Your host is Elena, and she's looking forward to enabling you to thrive on purpose. This is episode two of the Thrive on Purpose podcast series, and my guest is Paul McNamee. Paul McNamee is a former professional tennis player who won three Wimbledon titles and reached top 25 singles ranking and was ranked number one in the world in doubles. He is a devotee of the magic of clay. In tennis parlance, he describes it as his soul food. He recently published his second book, Welcome to the Dance. His career post-tennis led him to oversee 46 major events around the world, including the Australian Open. He is a strong believer that who you are comes from within. Welcome to Thrive on Purpose, Paul. I'm really delighted to have you here as my guest and looking forward to our insightful and inspiring conversation and thank you thank you for taking your th- this time to be with with me and with our listeners well it's my pleasure elena thank you so paul you grew up in australia what was life like well it, it, it it's a pretty good place to grow up i had a normal middle class upbringing my parents uh two brothers and a sister and you know as an australian you we've got the outdoors there's plenty of space and you get to try all sports you know whether it's football cricket golf you know and, and also tennis um whatever it is you, you give it a try and you've got that opportunity and, and you, you go to the country in summer and spend time on the river and running around as kids do so it was a normal australian upbringing i was very lucky and uh that helped help set me up for the adventures ahead in life wow sounds like you had a very fulfilling childhood and very happy and joyful childhood Yes, I did. And, you know, my parents were very close. Uh, they were married for 60 years. My mother is t- still alive. She's turning 100 this year, which is... Oh, <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. And she's still got her faculties and it's such a source of joy for all of us. Um, we hope she gets there. But even if she doesn't, she's had an amazing life and she's been an inspiration. And my father was a very honest, good man, an all-round sportsman. So they set good foundations, good boundaries for the children to follow. Yeah, it's so important to have good foundations early in life. So you're really a lucky man. Yes, because not everyone. I know very, very much so that so many don't have that opportunity. So, um, but it doesn't mean if you have a good opportunity that you're not going to blow it either. So you, if you get the chance, you've got to take advantage of it too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you're very talented in different kinds of sports. So I'm curious, how did you pick tennis? Well, that's interesting because most people you know are looking for advice and and you know and and parents are, are, are tending to push their kids into different sports you know they see their kid might be good at something whether it's tennis or golf or football and they're pushing them to get coached and spending money on it and, and on travel and all those other things and i do think it's the wrong way about um i found that that I didn't go to tennis. Tennis came to me. Tennis chose me. It wasn't the other way around. Now, whether it was because I had a particular flair for it, I don't know. I love the athletic side of tennis compared to golf, for example, where you just walk walk around. But tennis grabbed me. It was like a magnet. And I think what you want to do as a parent is expose your kids to different sports, different arts. It might be music. It, it doesn't have to be a sport. But of course, those things are very good for building character because you're in a team environment. You've got to get along with other people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, but I found that that the art or the skill chose me. It was the one that that was tapping me on the shoulder and saying, "Come here." And that's been a bit of a you know direction for me in life as well. When something tapped me on the shoulder, 
I realized more and more as life went on is you, you take note of that, uh, that, that friendly tap on the shoulder. Mm, that's amazing. That this means that, that you are listening to yourself. I, I guess I was, um, and that was at a pretty early age, at twelve, where I really uh, tennis became. I was all, I, be, I went all in, to be honest. Yes, <laughs> that's the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you for this uh, warm introduction and sharing about your childhood. So we are on purpose, and um, our episode today is when you protect your purpose, your purpose protects you. What does this mean to you, Paul? Well, I think purpose is is so important and and looking at what your purpose may be. But to do that, you need to look within. And I think as I went on further in life and I think really post my career, I mean, once I'd chosen to be a professional tennis player uh, after the normal struggles and I even I finished a degree beforehand because I just wasn't, I felt I wasn't good enough. I went to Europe and was blown away at, at how good the Europeans were on clay, a surface I wasn't familiar with, and that became a journey of love for me to d discover it and unlock its mysteries. But so I finished my degree, and then I, once I chose to be a professional tennis player, I guess my future was mapped out because the circuit kind of decides where you play next week. You go from one continent to another. You know, we're in the Wimbledon time frame now, and then it switches to the United States, getting ready for the US Open, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera was post career that my playing career that you, you know, and later in life where you, you, I realized you know that there were choices to make and how do you make those choices and where do you look for advice and I discovered you know quite late that the best place to look was was within actually and not outside the answers are normally within if you can open up your heart and open up your your being to find those answers mm. Yeah, that, that's, that's a great answer. So what I'm hearing is that your purpose in your early tennis career was protecting you because this was your passion, you knew that's the way and it was protecting you. And when did you discover that you need to listen within? Well, it was relatively recently that it all came to to make more sense to me. It was a couple of uh, more than a couple of years ago. I was in a relationship that wasn't, well, or thinking about going to a relationship that wasn't very effective, and I, I was being asked hard questions about who I really was, and and the questions such as. Uh, as an athlete and, and as kind of a brand, you know, how much of, of me is a brand and how much of me is a person? And I was being asked some searching questions and just just feeling like I needed to do some, some research into that myself. And I, I happened to be reading some literature and, 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 and particularly, uh, particularly a book by Don Miguel Ruiz from Mexico, The Four Agreements. And I was just fascinated with it. And I, as I was reading it one night, I was just, and I don't even remember the date when it was, um, I just discovered something where you are asked to embrace the angel of death. Now, that sounds quite dire in a way, the angel of death. But however, what it's saying to you is if you if you realize that you're not going to be here forever and that one day we're all going to pass away, the angel of death is going to take you away. You don't know when it is. It makes you look at, at life a little bit differently and, and, and to discover what's really important to you. What is your purpose? Don't wait because it will get taken away from you at some point. So I, that was really an aha moment for me when I realized, ah, now I understand what life's really about for me. I need to be true to my purpose, to, to really look within and, disc and and do those things that matter. And, 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 and I had the feeling, which has been borne out by everything I've learned since and discovered since, that if you, if you are true to your purpose, it will protect you. Because even if you, you may not get the success you thought in material terms or, or acknowledgement terms, you're, you're, you get such a great reward inside and you feel so fulfilled just being true to what your purpose is. And it's made it easier for me to make decisions about where I'm located, who I hang out with, where, you know, what, op you know, what options I might have to go forward each day and for the rest of my life. Mm. Okay, so, so what you just shared is that you were triggered from outside in that relationship and that 
this pushed you to seek, to find answers within. And then when searching, you got this aha moment and then this set you on a completely new journey. So what happened after this big moment for you, this big revelation, if I may say so? Yes, well, it set me on a holistic journey because I realized um, how important things like humility are humility is and compassion and how how if you're compassionate you almost get a greater reward than, than the gift that you're giving to someone else that i mean a taxi driver you know once said to me he said oh, you know why being happy is so simple all you need to do is make somebody else happy and i I'd, I'd heard that before but it hadn't resonated but now i understood some things that i had been tapped on the shoulder about earlier in my life I hadn't really picked up on so I was more open to picking up on those messages and um, I I had originally thought that I would go back to Australia I, I was spending a lot of time in the Balkans I was based in Istanbul for four years which was an exciting time in my life and spending a lot of time in Sofia Bulgaria and I had thought I'd go back to Australia but then then I met someone in Sofia and that drew me back to Bulgaria actually, which I hadn't have thought that that would be the case, but this was the journey. It's like a river. You don't know where it's going to take you. Um, you might think there's an obstacle and then suddenly the water goes around the obstacle and it keeps going. And this was the feeling I had uh, about my, my life opening up, even though I was in an age where you think I could be retired. No, not at all. I realized um, every day was great and, and I had so much to look forward to if I was on purpose. Mm, yeah, yeah. I, I like this uh, comparison with the river. I really like that because nature, nature tells us a story. So to me it sounds like you were trusting the process of life and you were listening to the signals, the subtle signals that were coming and then you were acting on these signals and then there you are. You're, you're thriving on purpose. That's what I'm feeling. So, Paul, can you articulate your holistic purpose in life? Well, picking up on the first part of you, you, your point was part of what a, a river does or nature or, or water is that it, it doesn't fight the obstacle in its way. It accepts it. So there might be a lot of might be a lot of obstacles in your life and a lot of things that aren't working out very well. But if you just accept it and maybe park it and, and notice it, but know that the water is going to keep flowing and another opportunity will arise. You may not know what that is. So I really had a strong sense of not being sure, and I'm still not 100 percent sure. How can you ever be what the future will hold? But I trust. I do trust the process. I trust the water will continue to flow, yeah. and that's that's the beautiful the beautiful part about nature and, and that holistic journey is you're open to what lies ahead and you don't fight as much or try and resist um, the no's that come along or the obstacles that are in your way. So that's that's how I, I do look at things now. Mm. Um, did I miss the second part of your, your question? Um, yeah, let's elaborate on this and then we'll come to purpose again. So uh, this is acceptance and trusting the process and, and, and acceptance comes first maybe uh, and many people out there struggle with acceptance um, I am noticing that you you have this quality to really accept and let go things in life how's that happening for you well that's right and I, I think that the other interesting part of that is that especially if you're attracted to material things you may think that you own them in some way or the, you know when in fact we don't and talking about the acceptance um i i've never forgotten the beautiful moment in the movie out of africa when meryl streep and robert redford i mean just amazing actors and what, what a movie it's probably for me my favorite movie and it was set in africa and it was just beautiful and and Meryl Streep was having a problem. She was playing a Danish writer and having a problem in 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 letting go of the of the property that that she owned, you know, because of because of the the fires were coming and then, and and the fact that she was having trouble paying paying to be able to the upkeep of the property and um, she was starting to get devastated that she might lose the property and then she said to Rob Redford, um, you know, I, I can't imagine that I'm going to lose this property that I own and. 
Robert Redford says in the movie, in the actor, he says, you don't own this property. You can never own land. This land belongs to Africa. You're just a custodian of this land, but it, but you can never own it. And once I understood that, that you, you can't own anything at the end of the day, even whether it's a partner or a, a, a house, a car, no, you're a custodian. So how are you doing in that role as a custodian? And, and, and understanding that difference um, for me was, was powerful. Oh, that, that's really, really powerful. And um, trusting the journey. Where do you find the strength to trust the journey with all its curveballs and the challenges well, yeah. you're facing? Well, it's purpose, and that's why I love uh, love your podcast and the title "Thrive on Purpose," and why I was attracted to to be a guest. And thank you for the honour of being the first guest because purpose is is, is where the trust comes, and and mm-hmm. just an inner inner knowledge of knowing that you're on track as a person and. You can't go wrong if you if you're true to your purpose. It's when you make compromises and mm-hmm. and don't set boundaries and go along with something that you shouldn't really be doing it. That's where you can run into difficulty. It might be immediate, but in the long run, that's not the way to go. And um, this, I think, this concept of purpose and of course the road to thriving i'm fascinated by and that's why i I was very happy to come on this podcast oh thank you so much yeah purpose is is our anchor in a way so how would you describe your anchor your purpose oh that's a good question i think i have found it and of course i've worked in many sports um as a ceo and running tournaments both in tennis and golf and basketball and football as in as in Australian rules football so having worked in the sports industry I think that's where my purpose lies but as I've gone along I, I'm just so saddened by the fact that in in my main sport the one that's closest to my heart being tennis that so few players are able to make a living um, the perception is is that it's such a rich sport when you look at the money that Djokovic and Federer and Nadal and even top 20 players are making, you think that it's such a rich sport and so many players would be doing well. But in fact, it's not true. Unless you're in the top 100 players in the world, you don't even get in the, the four biggest events, the Grand Slams. So what's what's the situation with the other players and the thousands of young players trying to make it? Um, they're just literally on the bread line. Um, I saw a check from a female player recently who played a, a very significant tournament and her check was for one euro after her um, after her, her entry fee was taken out. Um, one euro, and that's an example. Oh. So, for example, on the men's secondary tour, there's no prize money even in the qualifying on the challenger tour. So basically only, only 100 players make a reasonable living. Um, the next 100 can survive and after that, you're basically losing money. So to think in a major international sport that only 200 players really are breaking even, that, that's just extraordinary. When you look at football, European you know, soccer, you've got literally 10, 15,000 players will be making money around the world. Golf, there's over seven or 800 players making very good livings. And in, in every major sport in every country, which is normally football, you've got at least, you know, 12 teams with you know 30 players or 40 players on their squad at least 500 players so this is the one that saddens me so much um and and people think tennis players are spoiled and rich and it's just not true and i i just know i know how hard it was for me to break through when i played but i'll give an example when i played you know the 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 third level of tour was $25,000 in prize money. It's still $25,000 in prize money over 30, 40 years later. The secondary tour is behind the ATP tour uh, and the WTA tour for women. The secondary tour is the challenger on the ATP side. When I finished playing and even five, ten years after I finished playing, the highest level of challenges was $125,000 US dollars. Well, today, there's still 125,000, 125 they're called, and they're up to $150,000. But that's 30 years later. You've got $25,000. Know, you've got 10%, less than 10% growth in 30 years. So 
That's my purpose, I feel, to try and find a way to help more players make a living. These are these are quality players and they're called even the name calling them qualifiers is such a misnomer because they're such good players. These are players that are in the top one, two, three in their nations and they're on the they're you know, they're below the poverty line. How do you believe your purpose is protecting you today? Well, the way it protects you or protects me, my purpose, and I think that would apply to anyone, is once you realise what your purpose is, is, your choices are kind of a lot easier because I've got various options. You know, I've, I've been asked, would I like to be a tournament director again somewhere? How much more individual coaching would I like to do on the tour, for example? Um, you know, and But my heart, my purpose brings me to helping more players rather than picking one player to coach. I mean, I, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say, no, I wouldn't rule anything out. However, I keep being drawn to the broader issues of, 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 of a fairer dis- distribution in the sport. So that, that, what tends, that tends to um, uh, excite me. So I guess my purpose protects me by, by continually reminding me when I have options what really matters in my life right. and, and and I'm lucky enough to be in a position to do that. So it protects me from making bad decisions, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's very good and uh, it simplifies the decision-making it, process. It does, it does. Once you get in touch with your inner self and and your purpose starts to formulate, even if it's a little, might be a little foggy initially, but it starts to form. It's such a joyful revelation and you want to celebrate that and you look and, and your reticular activating system or your antenna is up, you mm. notice those opportunities. Yeah. That's what I've found. So that's amazing because now that you have discovered yourself, if I may say so, if you, you have your purpose, well, which you, is clear. Yeah, when, look, when I, when I talk about, sorry, I interrupt, but about discovering myself, it wasn't that I'm sad or anything that I hadn't discovered myself in a certain way in the past. I mean, I was in a way in blissful ignorance. I wasn't unhappy. Mm, yeah. It wasn't like I was, oh, I'm sad because, I, no, I, I, I wasn't grappling with those things. I was in kind of a blissful ignorance. Mm, mm. Now I feel I have That's a little... interesting yeah, expression. Yeah, yeah. So I was happy enough, mm. but now I'm happy, I feel, with more with more bliss and perhaps thriving, yes, <laughs> to use your, yes, to use your so words. So it's, uh, it's, you, you're blissful because you were blissful before as well. In ignorance though, yeah. I knew there was something missing in a way, but I, I, I either was too preoccupied, not humble enough, too focused and winning, etc., etc. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> While listening to you um, and explaining about your journey, I was thinking of being focused on the outer goal versus the inner goal. And what's really amazing is now with your wisdom and experience, when you're helping younger players, you can help them holistically, not only tennis-wise, because you have an immense knowledge in that field. However, you know more now, you know beyond tennis. And, and that's so important because this is how you live your purpose holistically. Well, I think I'm lucky to, to have discovered that. And I find as I'm coaching players now, if I can call it that, that um, it's more about teaching them how to fish than catching the fish for them. I mean, of course, you can say, hit your forehand there on the next point, or you should be serving serving wide at the back end, or hit a kick serve, do the Spanish one to kick serve followed by a big forehand, let's say. I mean, there are things you can be direct about as a coach, but I find that the joy and the joy I discovered, especially through Clay Quartz, The Journey of Clay, which I wrote about in my book, Welcome to the Dance, is is how to make a tennis ball dance. Well, you need to, uh, to, to develop the tools to do that. So when I'm coaching, I'm talking about the tools that you will need to one day be fulfilled in your journey. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's passing on tools and an insight into the tools so that the player discovers the joy of learning those things because if you learn to love something it's much easier to 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 thrive at it yeah yeah and 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 tennis is a metaphor of life how can you translate this experience and this knowledge to real life well it, it, it's the same challenges that you that you have in life that you have in 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 mar in trying to master your skills as, as, as an athlete or a musician or, or, a, or a husband or a father or, or in the workplace, the principles are the same. And 
it's 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 better if you're all in. Um, so that's why purpose really helps because if you can stay on purpose, you're more likely to be all in. And then you're all in as an athlete, all in as a father, all in as a as a partner, uh, all you know, all in uh, in in the workplace. And I I I I, I believe that you your your podcasts are about how especially how um, leaders can can thrive in the workplace and how teams and eventually organizations can really thrive. And it's, it's, it's the principle is the same is to, is to how have a common vision, a common purpose, a shared, a shared vision, but it, it, each person needs to look inside ideally when they're ready. And I, I, I've, I've had players that I wanted to coach and I couldn't connect with them. Mm. They just weren't ready for me or weren't ready to, Mm. To, to do that work, so we, we were just not going to connect. Um, the, the player, the, the, the student or the player has to be ready, otherwise I'm not really going to be much help. They're better off with somebody else. I mean, yeah, yeah. if they just want someone to tell them what to do, I'm not the right coach for them. Yeah, yeah. and it's very normal. We call this uh, a chemistry session. When I start okay. working with a client, they have a chemistry session first, so we see how aligned we are. And then we decide, we choose each other. It's always a mutual choice. We want yeah. this relationship to work uh-huh. because trust is at the core of this relationship to work in coaching. Trust, and not only in coaching, in all relationships, trust is at the core. Yeah, you're talking about chemistry. All I can think of on that is hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, <laughs> carbon, nitrogen, yeah, oxygen. Yeah, yeah. I can cite you the periodic table <laughs> because that's the way my brain works. Yeah. But you're talking about the, the chemistry of the, of the beautiful interaction between exactly. people where there's yeah. a trust. Yeah, yeah. I understand what you're talking yeah, about yeah. but you see where i was and where i am now absolutely yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's super super exciting you have an amazing career post tennis uh, right after your retirement in 1988 without hesitation you jumped into a completely new space you started the hopman cup this set you on a new journey you became an entrepreneur and leader you led the australian open for 12 years May I say that these major events were thriving under your leadership? Well, you know, we're very proud of what the Hopman Cup was able to achieve. It was in Perth, Western Australia. It was, yeah, I mean, I, you're right. I started that career the very next day after retiring. I lost to Pat Cash in the third round of the Australian Open. Uh, the Premier of Victoria offered me a seat in Parliament. Um, I'm a little bit on the... Not not so right wing, can I say it that way? <laughs> um, on that side of politics, and that was interesting. And I could have been doing. I had commentary opportunities, but I was I was fascinated by with a couple of friends in starting a tournament that could provide a team event for men and women because there wasn't one in tennis. We all know about Davis Cup for men, Fed Cup for women. There's even Labor Cup now for men. There's ATP Cup for men, but a team event for men and women. So that was interesting because it was an, it was an idea that hadn't, I'm fascinated with things that haven't been tried before. So I didn't even know um, where it could possibly be and, and, and the tournament and in fact, um, I heard about a new resort in Perth, Western Australia called Burswood Island. And having been to Florida and the Florida Keys and the islands that are near the coast there and in, other, in, in, in the Bahamas, etc. So I, I called up the, the head of the resort and I said, look, first one thing, I said, where is this Burswood Island? Um, because I'm just wondering, you know, if we've got a lot of spectators because we're hoping Pat Cash is going to play and maybe Steffi Graf, who won the Grand Slam that year. and. How would we get the spectators out to the island? Is, is there a good ferry service or is there a bridge? He goes, it's in the middle of Perth. It's on a river. <laughs> I, 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 didn't even, I, didn't even, I didn't even know that the island was called an island, but it wasn't an island. So they end up changing the name. <laughs> but, so, yeah, so starting something from scratch, I know, yeah, we had no idea where the tournament would be, um, who would play, and, 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 and how to get the sequencing right was very interesting professional challenge and because I'd always played in tournaments um, when the first player arrived Shuzo Matsuoka from Japan he broke a string the first day in practice and he said where's the stringer oh yeah we need a restringer because I was used to being the player and there's always those things there for you I, I, you know I hadn't organized a restringer to, to to fix these strings you know so it was just starting from scratch, and and I found that was interesting to start a business into running running an event, a major event mm. from scratch, um, because you you have to learn 
learn everything from from the bottom up. And mm-hmm. I've, you know, I found that was maybe better than top down. I mean, it made it easier to do things the other way around later on. But starting in the industry I was in. Mm. which is running events and you mentioned at the start of you know I've, I've run 46 major events now around the world wow. in tennis That's and golf impressive. yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah. and so but the first one the Hobman Cup which I ran for 24 years um, and I started and my company started it was um, we had 24 world number ones come wow. to the tournament in the most remote city in the world. I wow. mean, there is no more remote city. It's 2,000 kilometers to the next city. So how did you attract them? <laughs> well, well, okay. Well, it was two weeks before the Australian Open, which helped. So you know, get the timing right. You get the other things right. However, you know, Perth was not on the map in mm. terms of major events. Uh, it had the Ameri- America's Cup. But see, it lost the America's Cup. That's a big boat race, you know, and, and Australia had won it against the United States, which we always love to be the United States, um, <laughs> after 132 years or whatever. So it had gone to Perth uh, and then they lost it. So there was a gap. So the opportunity was, I could see, because Perth hadn't had a major event, had lost it, that there might be room for another one. The other thing was, I lived in Melbourne, on the East Coast, and the big cities of Melbourne and Sydney in Australia. Mm. Um, And, you know, a bit like London, Manchester, New York, LA, you know, there's a bit of a rivalry there between Melbourne and Sydney. But everybody said to me on the East Coast, don't go to Perth, nothing happens there. <laughs> don't go to Perth. Everybody said, don't go to Perth if you want to do this tennis tournament. And all I could think of was imagine the welcome I, I will get. If everyone says, don't go there, that will be red carpet I for really, going there. I really like that. It's counter cyclical. Yeah, it reminds me of breaking the rules. Yes. That's well, what I was talking about uh, during my yeah. first episode. And it's. You know, go the opposite direction where the crowd is. That's There's right. something well, you, you can discover there. There's an opportunity. Well, all I, re- all I heard growing up was, if it's, not, if it's not broken, don't break it. In other words, <laughs> if things are going well, just don't break it. But mm-hmm. then I read a book, if it's not broken, break it. <laughs> you see, which is the opposite. I'm much more into breaking what's working well in a way than not breaking it yeah, because yeah. things change. Everything evolves. Yeah. If you stand still, you're going backwards. Yeah. So if it's not broken and you accept that, you're going backwards. So I thought, we'll go there and check out what it's like. And, um, you know, it was amazing. It was a new resort there and, and casino yeah, and they yeah, had yeah. a stadium. It didn't have air conditioning, but but it was it was just part of that process. And, and I was very lucky because you need to get good players. And, and Steffi Graf's agent, Phil DiPicciotto, was an amazing guy. He, mm, mm. he did a deal with me, which was that, look, if the tournament happens, she'll play and she'll get that mm. fee. If it doesn't happen, don't worry about it. So it was a contingent, yes. Yeah, yeah. But that gave the ability mm. to then leverage yeah, that for yeah, everything else. Yeah. So you've got to find a way around an obstacle because – also, having just retired, I couldn't afford to take the risk of millions of dollars as well. Yeah, so yeah, it was a very yeah, tricky yeah, situation. Yeah. I mean, how many athletes blow their money within two years of retiring? And what was, I'm curious what, what was really driving you in taking these decisions because I can hear your passion. It's, it's really palpable. What else was driving you to, to keep on going? Because this was a huge event and it was yeah. super successful. It was yeah. thriving. Look, it just seemed to be at the time the thing that jumped out at me. It was a bit like tennis tapped me on the shoulder. Hopman mm-hmm. Cup, a team event for men and women, was tapping me on the shoulder. Mm-hmm. Give this a go. And, you know, having just retired, people will give you a chance initially. And I had a bit of a name and I thought, well, this is worth worth giving it a chance. And Pat Cash committed to it. It was my friend and that made yeah, obviously yeah. a big difference. Yeah. Uh, and then Steffi Graf. So once we had that foundation, but I, I was – I mean, I – I could have kept going. I mean, I didn't lose in the first round of the Australian Open when I retired. Mm. I lost in the third round now of singles. Now, people think, you know, if you're in the third round of the singles at a Grand Slam, wow, what a player, right? Yeah, yeah, you, you, yeah. Why are you retiring? Yeah, no, yeah. I was just ready to try something else yeah. in life because remember, it didn't define me being a tennis player. So I could have hung on and played, you know, not to Roger Federer's age, that's maybe too much, but I mean, I certainly had many years ahead of me, but no, I was ready in my life to do something else. The rest of my life was tapping me on the shoulder and this was the option that seemed to be right for me. And I thought, yeah. give it a go and yeah. see what happens. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, but By the way, I went to Perth thinking I was going for six weeks. 
because mm. I lived in Melbourne, right? Yeah, and I've retired yeah, to yeah, Melbourne. Yeah. So this is the first time I retired to Melbourne, ended up going somewhere else. The second time was now I'm in, you know, in Bulgaria right now. But <laughs> the first time I went to Perth for six weeks, stayed six years. <laughs> because I, I never imagined that running a tennis tournament was a 12 month job, but to do it well, you've got to be all yeah, in. Yeah. You need to be all in. And I, it wasn't like a tennis player rocking up. Yeah. No, yeah, so the, yeah. the, I learned. You know, I was learning, learning yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm hearing is being open to creating new opportunities and having a growth mindset, being ready to learn, and trusting the journey and the unfolding of this journey. Yeah. And, um, I'm very curious because you also run the Australian Open, and um, what qualities a leader needs in order to revitalize a brand because you revitalize the brand and you put it on 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 the world map well in that question you've mentioned the word brand revitalize the brand which is saying that it that it is a brand and the brand does matter because the brand uh is is what the is, is the soul of, of the event in a way and, and around a brand is values so we I felt that the Australian Open was a poor copy of Wimbledon, to be honest, at that mm. time. <laughs> and I actually had a rule which said not to do it like Wimbledon. <laughs> <laughs> now, everyone would say in tennis, well, what are you talking about? Wimbledon is so prestigious. Isn't that the standard bearer, the leader? Not to do it like Wimbledon because we need to be Australian in character. Wimbledon so British, just so traditional. They build a new court one and it looks like it's been there for 50 years. That's not by accident. Everything they do is on on brand, on message, right? right? They have the cue and make out, oh, how incredible they have the cue. I mean, it's a little bit orchestrated. That's okay because it's part of their brand, you see. Yeah, yeah. And so, and, and the French Open so chic. It's so, everyone dresses so well. And it's got the beautiful clay and Paris in the springtime. So it mm. reflects Europe coming out of the winter thaw and people, women dr coming out in dresses and going to outdoor cafes and drinking martinis and accordions <laughs> flowing. It, it, what a beautiful time to be in. In Europe, when it's coming out of coming out in spring, coming out of the winter thaw, U.S. Open is just in your face in New York City. I mean, yeah. Manhattan, I mean, what a city! That is the ultimate city, urban environment. It's just jumping. I mean, the U.S. Open is really raw and great. <laughs> I felt the Australian Open didn't really have a brand, so it was a great tennis tournament. It was arguably a big event, but it wasn't a, a brand. And and the mission that I was given uh, when I was made CEO, tournament director and then CEO of the Australian Open was was actually to bring the feeling of the Hopman Cup to the Australian Open because yeah. the Hopman Cup, it was about the love of the game, men and women, the joy of the sport, to mm. bring that feeling to the Australian Open and I knew we had to Australianise it. So mm. it had to be Australian in character. We're pretty easy going people, we've got the big outdoors, we like parties, we like the picnic, we like barbecue. So it was bringing that Aussie, you know, I had beach volleyball demonstrations in Garden Square with women in bikinis, you know. It was, <laughs> even though the weather in Melbourne's actually not that great in summer, it looked to Europe and the rest of the world, oh, I'd give anything to be Australia, you know, in, in January instead of being in the freezing cold in Europe yes, and yeah. look at look at the way you know, they're playing beach volleyball, et cetera, et cetera. So it was selling the feeling of Australia, the outdoors and, yeah. and the easygoing nature of, of, of the country. So being on brand and on message is really important and on purpose and it makes decisions easy because you know the courtside bar became the beach bar for example we, we changed the naming the nomenclature of the various elements of the tournament so everything had to reflect australia and its values we had australian australian singer instead of a, you know the sea great american singer that happened to be there let's say you know so all of the decisions about well what what side of our character, our nature, our essence do we want to reflect? So branding is very important, whether it's a tennis tournament or a business or a company, to be on brand, to be on purpose. So mm -hmm. I had a strong sense of that. And the question then is how do you pass that on to a group, to a team? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the challenge that one has, mm -hmm. I'm sure, in any industry is you might, as a leader, you may have an impression of what you think the brand is. but how do you explore that, test that, and then how are you able to get the buy-in of everybody so that you're, everyone's all in? That's a very, very important question. And many companies have this challenge to get this buy-in, this engagement. How did you manage to, to get the engagement of your people? 
Well, one of the best ways is having shared think tanks or even going away together. We used to go down the coast as a group uh, and, and just talk about what we felt the overall brand should be. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it's, you know, the other thing is if there's a good idea, most people kind of jump on that pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> you know, you know, most ideas have been thought of before, you know, yeah, you yeah. know not that original, but the talent is recognizing a good idea and saying, ah, we can go with that. And so yeah, yeah. I had a feeling that, you know, we were, we were th- in our think tank, should we be the leading event, the leading international event, mm-hmm. they're all different. And, and I said, what about the biggest event? <laughs> what about the biggest event? Australia's biggest sporting event. Oh, we're not that, we, you know, we've got a Formula One Grand Prix, you know, we've got the the grand finals in football. We're not, you know, we've got the Melbourne Cup, which is this massive horse race yeah. in November that we have a holiday for. Can you believe we have a holiday for a horse race? Okay. <laughs> okay. But that's part of the Australian background, you know, the horses. You know, we, we sent stock horses. Um, the famous Australian stock horses went to the, the light horses, went to the First World, World War, fought in Africa. Wow, oh, yeah. That's we had the We have the best, most versatile, resilient horses in the world. Wow. Is the Australian stock I horse. It's that. so yeah. versatile. Right? Kind of because we have a hard landscape. It's tough. It's dry. There's droughts. There's floods. I mean, yeah, these horses are resilient. So they they're the ones that go to war. You know, because they in the old days. So that's that's what we did. And so Australia's biggest sporting event was only arguably true. Mm. We went for three weeks. If you count qualifying, we had the most you know the most spectators by adding up everyone over the two weeks. It was arguably so, and that's the key in developing a brand is you, you've got to, in looking for the summit, you've got to set your the bar a little bit higher than where you are. So it was a bold statement, but arguably true. That's enough. And instead of doing a 30-second TV ad and doing 30 of them, mm-hmm. we did a 90-second TV ad and only did 10 of them. So you're paying the same, but by doing a 90-second TV ad, Gee, the Australian Open, that's getting big. It's the, mm. it's the perception that you're creating because you need to alter perceptions to alter reality. So that's that's where we were and that was a process we went through. So having think tanks with the team, getting a common buy-in, um, as I said, normally if there's a good idea by someone, everyone's going to jump on it and we got that buy-in and then letting the individuals in each department run with their area. And I remember our marketing manager, the lady, she was just jumping with joy when we ended up we ended up having 500,000 spectators. We were the first Grand Slam in the world to have 500,000 spectators. You know, we were the first Grand Slam in the world to have 50,000 spectators in the day. And then the big dream for me for me was to have a night final, to go in prime time mm. with a tennis match. I mean, that had never happened before, to have a final in prime time. No Grand Slam had ever done it in men's tennis, so in over 100 years. And that was my personal dream to achieve the night grand final and talk about needing water to flow around obstacles. Uh, that was almost mission impossible. And I found p- professionally, to have a challenge that was almost impossible was so exciting for me to, to, to take on that challenge and ultimately achieve it. Wow, that's an impressive story. So it's not only your passion, but also you being courageous and bold and trusting people and involving them and giving them the freedom after you agree or align on purpose and values and your ideas. So, so that's how you stood out as a leader. Yeah, well, That's what I'm hearing. Well, then everyone needs to be captain of their own area. I mean, the, I love that yeah, because because that's their passion. And I found that if someone's not happy in their job, I mean, I I once sacked somebody hmm. and I regret it. Except I learned an enormous lesson. And I, and that lady Jenny Roper, I put her on a pedestal. I mean, hmm. and I've told her that, and she she respects me for it. She, I said that's the biggest mistake I ever made was hmm. was sacking you because because you were in the wrong position and I didn't recognize that it wasn't about you and that you would have thrived in another area. It, 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 and so many bosses are happy to say, well, they, they just don't get it or they're not committed and they want to blame the employee for not performing. 
I, I see the fault, if there's such a word as fault, mm. it's not a good word, but mm. the blame is shared equally because they're not in the right position in the company. You put someone in an area that's closer to their purpose, they're going to thrive. I love that. And the organisation yeah. is going to thrive. So I'm. That, that, that's only, and I had in the end, it was, 3,000 people working on this drone open. But I, 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 would, I would never sack anybody. And, and when you started, how many employees did you have? Five. Wow. <laughs> That's impressive, the way it grew. Well, well, it was five on the core team, and then there was the Ben you had their staff. So, but the five now is, 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 you know, is now, when I left, it was around 40 people in the core team, in mm. my core team. So what, what, what really stood out for me is also listening to people having relationships with people, knowing your people, knowing your strengths, yeah. knowing their strengths. Yeah, and having their back. It's really important if you're a leader to have someone's back. I mean, one of my best guys, Rob, um, he, was in, he was in the operational area and we were, we were building a and we were converting an, an indoor facility into, into a hospitality center for the tournament. And, you know, he, he made a mistake and... Uh, we've got to, sh you know, we share that mistake, and so he knew um, we all make mistakes. So I was, I was very understanding and sympathetic of that, and we, and we ended up finding a solution. Another example was there was a ticketing problem when Qantas is our national airline, and hundreds of people from Qantas came on the, for the first semi-final instead of the second semi-final, mm. and it was Andre Agassi against Pat Rafter, who was a big Australian player. It was a massive match, was sold out, and they've all come on what we thought was the wrong night, expecting to get in. So we, I suspected it was not my team's fault that they'd come on the wrong night. The, the, the mis it was not our fault. But the point is, is that if something goes wrong, the best thing you can do straight away is apologise. Later on, you'll figure out how it happened and mm -hmm. apologize. And that creates the space and the environment to solve the problem. That's because amazing. Because once you say sorry, and we said we're so it's sorry simple. to, so sorry to so Qantas, simple. instead of them saying, well, and we were saying, well, we don't think we made a mistake and they, they're looking, well, we think you, you see, that's not an environment to solve. How do we get the people in on that night? They're there waiting. Mm -hmm. Say sorry. They don't mind now sitting in the back row instead of sitting in the front row just to get in because we've said sorry. So we created the space where there's empathy between us and we got everybody in that night. We got some people in the President's Reserve. We had some people, you summon did end up in the back row. But the point was they all got to see the match mm. because we said sorry. As it turned out, it wasn't our fault, but that wasn't the point. Mm. Create an environment yeah. where you can solve the problem. So being humble, being sorry. So in PR, terms I learned very early say sorry right away to create the space and the environment to have the right relationship to fix the problem where everybody walks away a winner so that even the person sitting in the back row instead of the front row feels I'm so grateful to be here tonight at this match oh, wow. yeah it's and so simple it's so simple it's so simple and it goes beyond ego yes. it's about humility because yeah. I, I remember um, a very powerful quote from Rumi, between wrongdoing and right doing, there is a space. I'll meet you there. That's what it, it reminds me of, because always looking for a win-win-win solution and, and going beyond ego instead of finger pointing, which is happening so often in corporate environments. So, so that's amazing. That's, that's strong leadership. That's really strong leadership. Uh, Paul, um, I want to ask you about your book, Welcome to the Dance, because you just released it and it's becoming really popular. I really love that. And I read it. I must say it's quite a holistic book. What's your favorite quote from Welcome to the Dance beyond tennis? Well, I was lucky enough to read about those philosophers and holistic gurus in a sense because they, they're far more fun online than I, have, than I am and so I, I mentioned the the book by uh, by uh, Don Miguel Ruiz and uh, I also was um, you know, I was interested in, in various authors and, and, and what they had to say but I think the, the quote that really resonated with me was from Herman Hesse's just beautifully scripted and, and book that he put together uh, I call Siddhartha which is is such an amazing book and it's about enlightenment and 
and, and I love the uh, the expression that he talks about in the book when he says when he portends the road to enlightenment being hearing the river speak to hear the river speak and I talked about water, the river and water before and, 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 and being open to listening to what the river is saying and for me it was listening to the nuances of clay just listening when I was you know for so many years not understanding what I was doing but being open to listening to its subtle messages mm. when to play slice when to play a drop shot you know when to do the things that Nadal who was the ultimate clay core player the chess master of clay to understanding what that means or to take take note of the way Novak Djokovic is so holistic and even though he's in trouble he he goes away spends a second little meditation breathing resets and comes back with new energy to understanding those principles that you you can really only discover on a clay court it, it, it's clay is the ultimate teacher in in my profession that I was in as a tennis player. And I, for me, it, it resonates very well with what um, Herman Hess was talking about in, uh, in Siddhartha, which was, which was just, uh, was, was such a special book. And um, I mentioned Ruiz before because when he spoke about the angel of death, and I didn't quite elaborate on that enough, he said, is, is, is how can you, he says, how can you become wild and free like a child, but you're not doing it with the innocence, mm. you're doing it with wisdom. Oh, I love that. I so those that. those quotes, those 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 guys are masters. And we the aim is how can we be the master of our own destiny in a way, but not again, not in a destination way, but but taking control in a way by not taking control, yeah. by not taking control, by accepting, listening, accepting, and then seeing the way forward. And allowing it to happen. Allowing Creating it to happen. Allowing, allowing it to, it to happen. happen. And, and, and trusting that if it's on purpose, you're always going to be fine. This is really beautiful. This is really beautiful. And, and, and just to add on this, in a very loud world that we're currently living, just creating space to listen. As you said, listen to the subtleties of life or in an organizational context, listening to the subtleties of the environment and what's really happening beyond what you're seeing is so important. Yes, and, and even the four quadrants, which I think are, uh, are a good sign, well, was a good sign post, post for me. You know, do you do things that are urgent and important, or urgent and unimportant, or not urgent and important, or not urgent and not important? I mean, and 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 we all do things that are important and they're urgent. Of yes, course, we're going to yes. do that. But the tough one, we're always, and we're not going to do things that are not important and not urgent. So the question is always between doing things that are urgent and not important or things that are important and not urgent. And if you're in the clutter and the hustle and bustle of life and rah, 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 going ahead, and, and well, maybe you're hiding from your relationship by your busyness at work, which often happens, mm. you gravitate to everything that's urgent. I need to answer that email. I got the phone call, you know, I'll always answer that right away. Urgent things uh, are a trap. What's important is what's important. So in choosing between urgent and not important or not important, uh, sorry, urgent and not important or important and not urgent. Hmm. Focus on what's important. You cannot go wrong because, again, that's on purpose. And spending enough time because that's the planning time. I love the expression, plans are nothing. Hmm. Planning is everything, the process of planning. Yeah. Oh, I've got a plan to go to Greece and the whole I've got a plan to, you know, do this with, 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 with you know, achieve this in the budget plans don't mean anything if you don't do the process of planning to achieve it yeah. and that that only happens in those moments when when you choose the important tasks rather than the urgent ones yeah. important but not necessarily urgent so you you go with what's important that is the planning process and if you do the planning you know good things will come um, especially when you're on purpose yeah. in the end i believe you can only thrive and your organization can only thrive. That's, that's my belief. Yeah, that, that's really amazing. And, and, and it's a good moment to, to really close this conversation because importance 
is rooted, if I may say so, in values and purpose. So then it's very simple to choose. It, it, it is simple, but, but, but busyness and urgency can can really push in. It can really push in. You know, I, I you know, I promised I'd I'd get back to somebody today. You know, with this debt, etc. So take the space to say the the beautiful no. Yeah. Um, I was talking about this, which Let's you start. talked about in, yeah, in your yeah. first episode. The beautiful yeah. no is. I really need to focus on what's important now. So I, I need to give a beautiful no to someone. I just can't meet that deadline, but I promise you, I'll, you know, I never say to break promises, but there is a way to say it if the person can live with that. Maybe they can't, and, and then, then it's urgent and important, of course. If, yeah, if yeah. the deadline can't change, that's urgent yeah. and important. Yeah. But if it can change, try to do that so you create the space to do what's important, what's on purpose for you, mm. your brand, your company, whatever it is, your team, your team. Yeah. And, yeah. and be be the person you want them to be in a way. I mean, mm. be. The, I mean, and we've heard that from Gandhi. I mean, we're quoting a lot of people. You know, be the change you want to be. So, yeah. uh, and I and I found good and bad that if I was that way and sympathetic and empathetic, then I noticed that cascaded through the organisation. Whereas if I was grumpy, and I was many times mm. grumpy in my earlier years. In mm. fact, they had a name for it. They called it a Mac attack. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't worry, it's a Mac attack. Right? <laughs> but if I gave a Mac attack to a manager, yeah, the next yeah. thing I could see was a Mac attack yeah. from that manager to one of their team who works for them. You see, yeah. it's not a good example. You have to be the change you want. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, this also reminds me of being versus doing. And um, I remember one of the 33 principles of, of uh, our coaching program just 33 <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah less yeah. is more yeah less is more it's how we live the principles but it's doing is work being is effortless and, and this is one of my favorite because we were talking about business of life and just tack 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 do this do that when do you stop when do you step yeah. back when do you connect with yourself where all the answers reside, if all your challenges. So it's about being on purpose. That's right. And, and, and if we use the analogy of the river, the river flows effortlessly. It's not being forced. It's just flowing effortlessly. So if you, if, if you, if you look and listen to that, I don't think you can go too far wrong. Yeah, completely agree. Thank you so much, Paul, for this exciting, passionate, insightful conversation. Lots of good stuff here. And uh, it was true pleasure and joy having you here. Well, it was my pleasure. And thank you for the beautiful questions you asked me. And I, I, I didn't even imagine that, that all of the things that I've been through and to, to get to this lovely place that I'm in now. So thank you, Elena. Thank you so much, Paul. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Thrive on Purpose podcast. If you're ready to embark on a transformational journey, you're most welcome to engage in a one-on-one conversation with Elena on the website thrivingleadership.net.